There is a science that uses the term psychology in another way. It is social psychology, and it has become one of the most important humanities. Gustave Le Bon was the first to speak in this science with his book In Our Hands, where the book became an important reference for understanding the psychology of the masses, their way of thinking, and the ways in which they are influenced and moved. It is no exaggeration to say that the book is a reference guide used by rulers and leaders of mass movements to understand the psychology of the masses and direct them towards the goal that the leader wants. A good example of which is the large masses employed by Hitler in World War II. Le Bon himself has even become a destination and a shrine for world leaders, who turn to him and discuss with him the content of his book. Nearly 150 years after the book was written, it still maintains its momentum and presence among intellectuals. The author provides clear answers to many of the questions raised about mass gatherings, such as, how do the masses get irritated? How are revolutionary groups originally formed? What fuses the masses towards a single goal? Are they certain beliefs or mainly religion? What is the role of the leader or leader in revolutions? More seriously, are the masses sane, nature-conscious and democratic, or irritable and rebellious? 1. The Age of the Masses the great coups that usually precede the transformation of civilizations seem to be settled by massive political transformations, but a closer study of these phenomena reveals that the real cause is the profound change in the ideas of peoples. The huge events that are reported in history books are nothing but the product of the invisible variables that plague human emotions. The current period is a period of transformation, and transformation and its root is two fundamental factors the destruction of religious, political and social beliefs and the creation of completely new conditions for existence and thought. The modern era represents a transitional and chaotic period and it is not easy to predict what will be generated in the future. At a time when all our old doctrines were crumbling and the old columns were falling one by one, we find that the struggle of the masses is the only force that nothing can threaten. The age in which we are now entering is indeed the age of the masses. The quantities of nations are no longer decided in the councils of rulers, but in the spirit of the masses. The power of the masses was born by slowly spreading some ideas that were planted in souls, and then by the gradual grouping of individuals through associations and association. And this gathering allowed the masses to crystallize their ideas, and then formed unions and labor exchanges, and sent their representatives to government councils. The construction of any civilization requires fixed rules, a specific system, the passage from the stage of instinct to the stage of reason, the ability to foresee the future, and a high level of culture, all of which are not available to the masses. The masses, by their destructive power, exert the work of germs that help to dissolve weak bodies or corpses. Knowledge of the same masses is the primary source of the statesman who wants not to rule entirely by them. All the great leaders and statesmen were psychologists unconsciously. Bonaparte, for example was wonderfully carried out deep into the psyche of the masses. And the psyche of the masses shows us how powerless they seem to be to form a personal opinion except for the opinions to which they have been taught. The most unjust tax can be the most practical for the masses if they are the least visible and the least heavy in appearance. Human beings never act on the basis of the principles of pure theoretical reason. 2. General Characteristics of the Masses In its ordinary sense, the word audience means the gathering of a group of individuals whatever their identity, but from a psychological point of view. In certain circumstances a conglomerate of human beings can possess new characteristics that differ from those of each individual who forms it. Then a collective, transient and temporary spirit is formed which I will call, and becomes subject to the law. Among the psychological characteristics of the masses are the fading of the conscious personality, the dominance of the unconscious personality, the orientation of everyone within the same line by the agitation and contagion of emotions and thoughts, and the tendency to turn the instigated ideas into direct action and practice. Thus, the individual is no longer the same, but becomes a robot whose will can no longer lead him. The audience is inferior to the singular human being in terms of mental and intellectual aspects, but this audience can go for the better. And this depends on the way in which it is instigated. It is true that they are somewhat unconscious tournaments, but history is only made by tournaments like this. The masses are like the cards that the hurricane plays with and scatters in every direction, and this characteristic makes it difficult to judge. And if it were not for the necessities of daily life, which constitute a kind of invisible balance regulating events, democracies would not have been able to continue, and in all the psychological characteristics of the masses intervene. There is a difference between the Latin public and the Anglo-Saxon public. The masses are feminine everywhere but the most feminine are the Latin masses. The public is incapable of appealing to reason, and deprived of every critical spirit, therefore, it shows unparalleled speed of belief, 
as well as a tremendous capacity for amplification and distortion. With the result that history books should be regarded as books of pure fiction, they are fictitious tales of poorly observed fact and are accompanied by interpretations that have been formed later. The masses can only be moved and influenced by extremist emotions and violent slogans as well as repetition without proving anything by rational argumentation. And the masses know only simple and extreme emotions, for the masses tyranny and fanaticism are very clear emotions and they tolerate them with the same ease as they practice. And since the masses are always ready to rebel against weak power, they bow their heads in submission only to strong power. And if the prestige of power is intermittent, it returns to its extreme character, moving from chaos to slavery, from slavery to chaos. Believing that revolutionary instincts dominate the masses means ignorance of their psyche. The explosions of uprising and destruction that occur from time to time are only transient phenomena. If left to themselves, they get tired of chaos and instinctively turn towards slavery. The influence on the individual involved in the audience is done by focusing on the emotions of glory, honor, religion, and the homeland. So the masses are capable of the highest types of morality. 3. Ideas of the Masses Whatever ideas suggest or incite the masses, they can only become dominant provided that they take on a very simple form. Once an idea is instilled in the soul of the masses it acquires irresistible power, and it is not enough just to prove the validity of an idea in order to do its effect. It is true that the bright truth can fall on deaf ears, but you will see the same person after a few days returning to his old arguments and in exactly the same words, because he is under the influence of previous ideas. The masses are somewhat like a sleeper whose mind is temporarily disrupted and leaves himself vulnerable to the emergence of a strong and intense image. It is on the basis of the popular imagination that the power of states was founded. Knowing the art of influencing the imagination of the masses means knowing their art of governance. 4. Factors that shape the beliefs of the masses The factors that determine the views and beliefs of the masses are of two types, distant factors and near factors, and among the distant factors, race. As well as inherited traditions, the masses are an organic bee, and like all organic bees, they can only be changed by slow genetic accumulation. The true leaders of peoples are their inherited traditions, and without fixed traditions there can be no civilization, and also time. It is he who cooks the opinions of the masses on a quiet fire. Some ideas that can be realized in one period seem impossible in another. Political systems do not it breaks down in a day. As for political and social institutions, they represent the product of race, and sometimes it takes several centuries to form a certain political system, and several other centuries to change it. The people never have any real ability to change their institutions, but they can modify their name by igniting revolutions, as well as the factor of education and education, where it can be easily proved that education does not make man more moral or happier, and that it does not change his instincts and genetic whims, and if applied badly it becomes harmful. All these students can only employ a small number of them and leave others without work. With education, the spirit of the masses improves or is corrupted, for they are partly responsible for this. Direct factors include slogans. The imagination of the masses is particularly influenced by images, as well as the power of words is linked to the images they provoke. And the words whose meanings are difficult to determine precisely are the ones that sometimes have the greatest ability to influence, such as the word democracy, for example. And when the masses feel a deep aversion to the images provoked by words after political coups, the first duty of a true statesman is to change these words without touching the same things, of course. So the prowess of referees is to figure out how to manipulate words. Among them are illusions. People tend towards illusions just as an insect turns towards light. Whoever knows the illusion of the masses becomes their master, and whoever tries to scare illusions about them becomes a victim of them. And there is also the factor of experience. It is the only effective methodology in order to firmly implant a truth in the soul of the masses, and to destroy illusions that have become too dangerous. In general, the experiences experienced by one generation are useless for the next generation. So we find it necessary to repeat the experiences from age to age in order to exert some influence and succeed in destabilizing a strongly entrenched mistake. And there is the factor of reason which is a negative factor in influence and not a positive factor. The masses are not affected by rational needs, which is why the movers of the masses never turn to their mind, but to their emotions. 5. Crowd Drivers Once a number of living beings have come together, they instinctively place themselves under the authority of a leader. He plays a huge role for the human masses. The masses are a herd that cannot do without a master, and they get more obedience and obedience from the masses than any government. The drivers of the masses can be divided into categories, active men with a strong but temporary will, others with a strong and lasting will. And these leaders spread their ideas among the masses by means of naked affirmation, 
and devoid of all rational argument, repeating it constantly. And in the same formulations and words, it ends up being instilled in those deep corners of the unconscious, where all the motives of our actions are made. And then these thoughts, emotions and emotions are transmitted between the masses by intellectual contagion. These ideas must possess a secret power that we call prestige or respect, a kind of attraction that an individual exerts on our soul and fills it with surprise and respect. And this prestige may be acquired either by name, wealth or fame, it may be subjective or personal, and form a queen independent of every title or every authority, and make those around him blindly obey him just as the savage bear obeys its tamers. But this personal prestige always disappears with failure. The hero whom the masses applauded yesterday may publicly despise him tomorrow if luck turns his back on him, and may be wrested away by discussion and argument, so that in order for a person to maintain his prestige and admire him by the masses, a distance must always be established between him and them. 6. The Limited Change of Beliefs and Opinions of the Masses There are the great faiths that last for many centuries, and on which an entire civilization is based, and their formation and fading represent for each historical race the peak points in its history. And it is very difficult to destroy these doctrines after their formation until after violent revolution. And after the doctrine has lost almost all its dominance over soul, and this starts from the moment people begin to discuss and criticize them. Above these fixed doctrines is a superficial layer of opinions and ideas that are constantly born and die, some of which are very temporary and the most important of which do not exceed the life of one generation. 7. Audience Classification The categories of the masses can be divided into heterogeneous masses, including oblivious masses, such as street masses, and non-oblivious masses, such as parliamentary assemblies. And with the exception of the race factor, the only important classification for heterogeneous masses is the separation between being oblivious and unoblivious. The sense of responsibility of the latter is evolving and it often imposes different orientations on their actions. The masses are homogeneous, including sex, cliques, classes, sex, sex, members of different cultures and professions, and are linked only by faith and faith such as religious communities. And the clique is the highest degree of organization that the public is capable. 8. Criminal Masses The crimes of the masses are generally the result of massive incitement, and the individuals who contributed to them are later convinced that they have fulfilled their duty and we can cite the murder of the director of the Bastille prison. 9. Electoral Masses These masses can be tempted in a number of ways, including that the candidate possesses personal prestige, and these cannot be replaced by anything else. Having prestige alone is not enough to ensure success, but the candidate should flatter the voter and flood him with as many promises, and he should crush the counter-candidate by perpetuating accusations through confirmation and repetition. Also, the written program should not be very accurate because its opponents can confront it later. Promises can promise the voter huge reforms without any fear of it and without having to keep those promises. The voter forgets these promises completely, even though the elections are decided on the basis of these programs and promises. One of the factors that affect the electoral public is words and slogan. A preacher who knows how to use them manipulates the masses and leads them as he pleases. 10. Parliaments The general characteristics of the parliamentary masses are no different from other masses. They are highly susceptible to incitement and contagion. And in each session the parliament expresses ambiguous opinions fueled by constant fear of the voter and always comes to balance the influence of the driving leaders, who are ultimately the real masters of debates on which the deputies do not have prior or fixed opinion. The parliaments are the last place where genius can radiate and in which only rhetorical eloquence proportional to time and space is important. Despite all the difficulties of managing it, it is the best way people have found so far to govern themselves, and it is threatened only by two serious dangers, forced waste, and the gradual restriction of individual freedoms. 11. Stages of Transformation of Civilizations At first you find a few men of diverse origins who have come together according to the whims of migrations and conquests. Nothing connects them, then time passes and completes its work and these heterogeneous units begin to fuse together to form a single race. And then a new civilization can be born, and after civilization reaches a certain level of power and complexity it stops growing, and once it stops it becomes condemned to rapid decline. One of the characteristics of this inevitable hour is the ideal that supported the spirit of the human race that made this civilization. And with the final loss of the ideal the race ends up losing its soul, and only scattered atoms of isolated individuals return. That is, it returns to what it was at the beginning. And this is the life cycle of any people. Moving from a state of barbarism to a state of civilization by pursuing a dream, then entering the stage of decadence, 
and death as soon as that dream loses its power.